Egypt, 30 BC, the day, August 12th. The most dramatic day in the history of the 1,000-year-old civilization of Egypt. Cleopatra VII of the Ptolemy dynasty, queen of Upper and Lower Egypt, commits suicide by allowing herself to be bitten by an asp, the symbol of ancient Egypt. By this action, Cleopatra not only ends her life, she also delivers her beloved city, Alexandria, and the entire Egyptian empire into the hands of her bitter enemy, the aggressors from the north, the Romans. Thus ends one of the most glorious monarchies in the history of civilization. The city of Alexandria is situated in the northern part of Egypt, where the Nile widens like a web at its famous delta and flows into the Mediterranean Sea after winding thousands of miles through the desert. Today, Alexandria has the second largest population in Egypt after Cairo. From the time it was founded in 332 BC by Alexander the Great, it remained the capital of Egypt until the death of Cleopatra, when the kingdom became part of the Roman Empire and one of the richest provinces in North Africa. The rapid urbanization of Alexandria has made it difficult to find treasures in the ancient city center where ruins remain buried beneath city streets and buildings. The situation is quite different than it is in the religious centers of Karnak and Luxor, and the ancient city of Thebes, where streets, buildings, and huge monuments still allow us to imagine their original splendor. The Alexandria of Cleopatra's time, the marvelous city the queen loved more than any other, has therefore been lost forever. However, if we look closely, we can still piece together the way in which Cleopatra lived and the reasons Alexandria was such a powerful capital. Cleopatra was the last descendant of the great pharaohs and a highly educated woman. Her great cunning and romantic liaisons with Roman generals Julius Caesar and Mark Antony allowed her to hold on to this magnificent city and keep Alexandria intact. For more than 2,000 years, Alexandria was the largest city of Egypt. Its great port and the way it was laid out by Alexander the Great allowed it to grow quickly. When Cleopatra took over in 51 BC, it was the commercial and political hub of the Egyptian Empire. We can imagine Cleopatra looking out lovingly over her city, perhaps from a perch in the magnificent lighthouse on the island of Pharos. The stones from the fallen lighthouse now lie crumbled in the sea. But when it was built in 280 BC, the lighthouse of Pharos at Alexandria was one of the seven wonders of the world. From its high balcony, Cleopatra could see her extensive kingdom in every direction as far as 60 miles away. Of the famous Seven Wonders, that is, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Temple of Zeus at Olympia, the Pharos of Alexandria, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, and the Pyramids of Giza. Only the pyramids are still standing today.
The few remains that were left of the Pharos of Alexandria were incorporated into a fortress at the port. The lighthouse was built by the architect Sostratos of Nidus near the middle of the third century BC. And during the reign of Ptolemy II, Philadelphos, one of Cleopatra's ancestors. Numerous earthquakes had damaged the lighthouse until in 1480, Sultan Qayyit Bai had the fortress built using many of the remains of the lighthouse. Some granite columns are still visible on the main door and on the boundary walls that plunge into the sea. The lighthouse, along with the other five lost wonders of the ancient world, is shrouded in mystery. What did it really look like? How big was it? Considering that Egypt had so little wood, what material did they use to keep the great beacon burning? There are some drawings and descriptions from travelers who visited the lighthouse before it was destroyed, but they tend to be confusing. What does exist, however, although it was never made public, is a small-scale copy of the lighthouse in perfect condition, made in the same period as the real one. It is here in a place called Abu Sir, a village nearly 25 miles from Alexandria. The archaeological remains of the ancient city of Taposiris Manya, a thriving North African city during Cleopatra's lifetime, surround the village. This lighthouse, just over 50 feet high, doesn't have the majesty of the Pharos, but it does give us an idea of what it must have looked like. The great lighthouse was three stories high, with the first story square, the second octagonal, and the third circular. Perhaps it wasn't the only one of its kind built. The coastline between Alexandria and Taposiris could have had many such lighthouses. If we project this architectural model upon the old fort in Alexandria, we can see what the great lighthouse looked like. It is a three-story structure, surrounded at the base by some small temples and an enclosure. The light it projected could be seen tens of miles away, and even to this day, we still wonder how that was possible. They must have used reflecting mirrors but the fuel must have been wood, hard to find in the area, or straw mixed with animal dung, a compound that emitted great heat but little light. Archaeologists have recently guessed that the enclosure was for storing flammable material, perhaps petroleum that was already being used in those days. For Cleopatra, who might have wanted to look for a sailing ship on the horizon bringing messages from Rome, the building was perfect. It was 500 feet high, a record for a monument of the ancient world. The history of Egypt's last years is closely related to the life of its great queen. Cleopatra descended from the dynasty of the Ptolemies, founded by Ptolemy E. Soter, a Macedonian general under Alexander the Great. There is debate as to what she looked like. She is portrayed on some coins, perhaps inaccurately, with a protruding chin and a prominent nose. Yet she surely must have been charming and charismatic, and we know she was determined and strong-willed and undoubtedly a shrewd politician. At the beginning of her reign, when she was only 15 years old, Cleopatra embarked on a southbound journey up the Nile, officially for religious reasons. As the pharaoh, her presence had been requested at a place called Armont, just south of Thebes, to participate in a ceremony. It may have been on this trip that Cleopatra for the first time saw the great pyramids of Giza near Cairo. She was probably as stunned as we are today to see these massive and beautiful monuments structures built over 2,000 years before Cleopatra was born. The pharaohs before her had constructed the pyramids as tombs for themselves and their immediate families, and as temples of worship. Cleopatra often took trips within her kingdom. 
Apart from her normal duties as sovereign, she wanted to make sure that her dynasty was continuing the legacy started by the pharaohs who preceded her. She must have sailed up the Nile to the city of Dendera, on the river's left bank, because the greatest development of both the city and temple of Dendera date from Cleopatra's time, the last period of the Ptolemaic dynasty. They are examples of the notable architecture accomplished during Cleopatra's reign. Burned by the sun and wind and swallowed up by the desert sand, almost nothing remains of the ancient city of Dendera today, except for one imposing structure that's still standing, the enclosed sanctuary with a temple dedicated to the goddess Hathor. Hathor, wife of Horus and mother of Ihi, god of music, was the ancient Egyptian goddess of love and was generally depicted with human features. Horus was the son of Isis, the mother god of Egypt, and of Osiris, god of the underworld and judge of the dead. The personal implications connected to worshipping these powerful gods was surely the main reason why Cleopatra was interested in the sanctuary. These implications are still legible in stone and are one of the most interesting enigmas of ancient Egyptian history. In ancient times, Dendera was called Tantere, but under the Ptolemaic dynasty, it was known as Tantyrus, its Greek name. Cleopatra would have been familiar with both names since, according to ancient sources, she spoke seven languages. To this day, the sanctuary appears like a real city surrounded by mighty walls, 330 yards long on both sides. The main gate, obviously added later, dates from the time of Roman emperors Domitian and Trajan, who were ruling the land 200 years after Cleopatra's death. Through the gateway, we can see the front of the gigantic temple of Hathor. As she walked through the front portal and looked up toward the sky to the molding above, Cleopatra would have seen the benevolent rays of the sun represented as giant wings. On the inside, there is a depiction of one of the countless images symbolizing motherhood that are scattered around the temple. It illustrates the goddess Isis, seated, breastfeeding little Horus, the future husband of Hathor. Along the temple's side wall, we can see Hathor breastfeeding Ihi in the presence of a pharaoh paying them homage. Many temples of this period had colonnaded courtyards leading up to them. The Temple of Dendera, instead, went without a colonnade to make the front of the building more imposing. The six gigantic columns of the building itself are connected at the bottom by a wall and crushed by a hefty cornice to form the entrance to the vestibule. Entering the temple was considered an initiation and spiritual voyage. Cleopatra, the only non-priest who would be allowed inside, would find herself walking through a series of rooms where the natural light would grow dimmer and dimmer until she reached the most sacred place in the sanctuary, the cella, where the statue of the god was placed. Then the light would take on an almost mystical brightness, a reflection of the god's metaphysical presence. A number of staircases connect the temple to the terrace above. It is here that statues for worshiping the goddess Hathor were brought in a solemn procession once a year so that they could unite with the rays of Ra, the sun god. From the terrace, we can see the many buildings in the sanctuary. This is the sanatorium, like a hospital with many small rooms where the sick used to wait for the goddess to visit them with a cure for their ailments. This well-preserved building is one that dates from the period when Egypt was already a Roman province. It is the Mamisi of Trajan. The Mamisi is a very common building in Egypt, a sacred place where rites were performed connected to the birth of the son of the sacred couple who were worshipped in the main temple. 
The Mamisi at Dendera is dedicated to Ihi, Hathor's son. This relief depicts his birth, feeding, and growth. Standing out from those who are worshipping the sacred child is this figure, dressed like a pharaoh, whom we meet in the main temple. But he's not Egyptian. The hieroglyphic text identifies him as Nero, the Roman emperor. These figures on the boat of life are emperors Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and Nero. On the south side of the temple, shaped like lion's heads, are gargoyles, which besides being decorative, carried rainwater to the outside of the building. The figures sculpted in the wall below them convey an entire scenario, this time instigated by Cleopatra. This gigantic bas-relief depicts Cleopatra introducing her son Caesarion, whom she had had with Julius Caesar, to the goddess Isis, who is preceded by her son Horus, represented as a child. What was Cleopatra trying to communicate with this original relief? According to a recent study, the similarity of Cleopatra's and Caesarion's position with the position of the two gods is thought to be a mirror image of Isis and Horus. But that's not all. Osiris, Isis' husband, who was killed by his enemies, is not portrayed in the bas-relief, and neither is Caesar, who was slain by Brutus and the senators. By this clear similarity with the powerful goddess, the great queen wished to be considered as the new Isis. And as a goddess, she reminded the Romans that she was the only legitimate sovereign of Egypt. Another great sanctuary of the Ptolemaic period that Cleopatra must have visited on one of her trips to the south is the one dedicated to Isis on Philae. Because of its great beauty, the island of Philae was called the Pearl of the East by travelers in ancient times and has been a favorite of artists and painters throughout history. The unusually beautiful monumental complex almost disappeared when it was being swallowed up by Lake Nasser in 1968, UNESCO and the Egyptian Ministry of Culture called for the international community to help. An Italian company, led by architect Giovanni Iopolo, was called upon to meticulously rescue this architectural beauty. He had the entire complex taken down and put up again on the island of Agilchia, about 330 yards away from its original site. This is where the sanctuary still stands today. It took almost seven years to finish the work of surveying, taking down, transporting, restoring, and reassembling the millions of stone blocks that made up the original sanctuary. The temple, which was erected in its present form by the Ptolemies in the first half of the third century BC, is dedicated to Isis as the creator of life. She is portrayed there in numerous bas-reliefs as the goddess who brought her husband Osiris back to life after he was murdered by his brother Seth. Pilgrims traveled to the temple from every part of Africa and beyond. Even the Roman emperors were devoted to the goddess. Proof of this is found in the elegant pavilion that the emperor Trajan had built. Despite its monumental appearance, it was an airy structure that was large enough for processions to enter inside. The sanctuary at Philae was the last center of the ancient Egyptian religion. In the Christian era, when various churches were erected beside the temple using the pagan monuments of the sanctuary, the temple continued to be considered the house of the goddess Isis the great mother of Egypt. The goddess did not seem extraneous to Christians. The depiction of Isis breastfeeding Horus is the forerunner of the Madonna and Child. Also, the salutation to the god Amun, who was worshipped to a lesser extent on Philae, 
became the famous Amen, the Hebrew and Christian salutation. The splendid sanctuary at Dendera and the incredibly beautiful and spiritual one on Philae were places that were always dear to Cleopatra's heart until the end. According to Egyptian religious belief, by dying bitten by a snake, a creature sacred to Isis, she secured eternal life. When Cleopatra went to Rome in 47 BC with the son she had had with Julius Caesar, the magical civilization she represented followed her to the new capital of the world. Rome was mesmerized by the tantalizing queen and her culture and began building Egyptian-type monuments in Rome itself. It was built by Gaius Cestius, who died in 12 BC. The pyramid is completely covered in white Carrera marble and was built in record time, a little less than 300 days. Cleopatra would have loved the irony of her conquerors copying her country's treasures. The obelisks were the first great masterpieces of Egyptian civilization brought to Rome. Though some Greeks and Romans mocked them, the Greeks called them obeliskoi or skewers, while the Romans called them Cleopatra's needles, the obelisks were placed in front of temples as monuments connected to worshiping the sun and were generally covered in hieroglyphics. One of the many mysteries that shrouded Egyptian civilization was how these gigantic columns were built and carried to Rome, considering that they are monoliths, meaning that they are cut out of a single stone block. These are some of the largest Egyptian obelisks in Rome, the city that boasts the largest number of them. This obelisk is situated in the Piazza San Giovanni in Laterano. Originally from Thebes, it is made of red granite and is the tallest obelisk in Rome. Emperor Constantius had it moved to Rome in 357 AD. The obelisk in the Piazza del Popolo was erected by the great pharaoh Ramses II. Originally it was at Heliopolis, but Emperor Augustus had it moved to Rome in 10 BC to commemorate the 20th anniversary of Cleopatra's defeat. Over the years, Rome's collection of statuary, bas-relief, and precious objects from Egypt grew. The Capitoline Museums house many statues of Egyptian gods and sphinxes, like this one in red Aswan granite, that dates from the time of Cleopatra. It was found in 1856 in the Via Sant'Ignazio in Rome, a street in the city center where much evidence of Egyptian sculptures has been found. But that's not all. A number of excavations have confirmed the presence of an Egyptian temple in the heart of Rome, a possibility that seemed unbelievable before. Here in the zone of the ancient Campus Martius, a great temple existed that was dedicated to Isis and Serapis, an Egyptian god invented by one of Cleopatra's ancestors. The monument has been completely lost but it looked much like the other famous Egyptian temples, those on Philae and at Dendera. The Romans were not the only ones who came here. The Egyptians did too. Their community, the largest group of foreigners living in Rome, is located in the present-day quarter of Trastevere. Cleopatra probably never imagined she would have such influence on the Romans. The passion, interest in, and enthusiasm for all things Egyptian that has engrossed Europeans over the ages is the legacy of this educated and refined queen, the shrewd politician and loving mother who never lost her concern for the needs of her people. After the dark shadow cast on her personality by the Roman victors, Cleopatra's image has now taken on a brighter light though there is still some debate among scholars as to what she really looked like. According to some writers, she was beautiful. To others, she was not. The few Egyptian portraits we have, like the one at Dendera, are sketchy. 
and there are far too many portraits, busts, and statues believed to be her that it is hard to know which is the true depiction. Perhaps it would have remained one more unsolved mystery if it hadn't been for art historian Paolo Moreno. He believed that the Esquiline Venus housed at the Capitoline Museums is in reality a full-figure portrait of Cleopatra done while she was living in Rome. Many scholars now share this belief. Seeing her portrait in this statue is like bringing the great queen back to life. Cleopatra herself would have loved this, for one of her strong beliefs was the saying, keeping your face is keeping your soul. In many hearts, the face and soul of Cleopatra live forever. Ancient Egypt. It was here that one of the most fascinating and mysterious of cultures originated. A civilization ruled and dominated by the pharaohs for some 3,000 years before Christ. It is conceivable that no one in the history of mankind wielded more power than a pharaoh in ancient Egypt. More than the Roman emperors, more than the kings of Persepolis or Babylonia, the pharaohs ruled with an iron hand and were worshipped as direct descendants of the sun god. They were considered immortal, capable of subduing the forces of nature. Their magnificent tombs and the temples they erected in honor of the gods have indeed seemed to bring them a kind of everlasting life. Though their cities disappeared mysteriously as if swallowed up by the desert sands, their stories live on. How do we know so much about these fascinating rulers? Modern-day Egypt lives side by side with remnants from the times of the pharaohs. Giant statues. The pyramids that adorn the left bank of the Nile, where the sun sets. The magnificent temples such as those in Karnak and Luxor, built by the hard labor of hundreds of thousands of workers, still stand. But what is left is only a fraction of what the giant cities must have been. So why, in spite of the skill of these ancient builders, has so little of these ancient cities survived until today? The answer lies in the importance attributed to the buildings. While temples and pyramids were destined to withstand the onslaught of centuries, ordinary people under the pharaohs had to make do with crude mud bricks and straw dried in the sun, techniques that are still in use today. And yet, these were magnificent cities, such as Memphis, the pharaoh's first capital. We know about these cities because of the legacy of scribes, writers, at that time. This sculpture of a scribe from the Cairo Museum is an example of a man who could have lived his entire life in one of those crowded city streets at the time of the pharaohs. Scribes were highly respected figures in ancient Egypt. Years of study taught them to master the art of writing hieroglyphics, and they enjoyed privileges and honors reserved for upper classes. Writing was beyond the scope of the great majority of the population and was thus shrouded in mystery. Scribes made up a unique profession. Many of them earned their living by writing out and copying public and administrative documents. 
The Nile River was the lifeline of ancient Egypt and the home of most of the important cities. Memphis, just a few miles south of Cairo, was the first capital of the pharaohs. The road sign indicates the village of Mitrahina, announcing that we have arrived at the gates of the capital. It is difficult to imagine that such a desolate spot could have been the heart of one of the largest and richest cities in the ancient world. And yet, 4,000 years ago, there were majestic palaces and temples here, surrounded by an intricate maze of houses and streets. Memphis was home to some of the greatest minds of the era, brilliant scientists and refined sculptors, artists that created this alabaster sphinx, or this statue of Ramses II, one of the most impressive in all Egypt, buried under the sands for thousands of years. Nowadays, nothing remains of the ancient splendors of Memphis beyond this simple village, which is surrounded by the desert and a few date plantations. What became of this powerful metropolis founded by King Menes in 3100 BC? This is what remains of the Temple of Ta, thought to have been one of the largest in ancient Egypt. Much of it is still buried under the small hill where the village of Mitrahina lies today. The problem is, when Memphis went into decline, its monuments were dismantled and the stones were used as building material for new construction. In the distance, you can see one of the many temples that adorned Memphis in a later period. And this is how the capital itself might have looked if you attempted to cross the bustling streets of the city center over 4,000 years ago. As scribes have indicated, bakeries were an important part of life at that time. If you needed bread in the morning, you would have gone to a bakery like this one and bought a very special tasting bread. Bakers would remove the soft inside part of a loaf and sprinkle it with vinegar and water. Then the hollowed out loaf would be stuffed with a mixture made of pepper, honey, mint, coriander, cheese, salt, and oil. The oven stood in the courtyard of the baker's workshop. Bartering was the sales method used, as money wasn't introduced until 500 BC, many years later. If you had to get some official papers signed, you would have to go to the residence of a high state official who probably lived in a luxurious and prestigious house like this one. In the large dining room, he would probably have a display of exquisite vases, jars, and furniture, a mark of the taste and status of their owner. The higher social classes loved to surround themselves with exquisite objects and wore elegant clothing complete with wigs and jewelry. Perfumes and cosmetics were also widely used by men. It was the custom to wear a cone of ointment on one's head, which melted in the heat of the day, saturating wigs and garments with perfume. In homes like this one, owners entertained their guests with sumptuous banquets. But what types of food and drink would be served at the table of a rich Egyptian? What was their diet? Since Egyptians aspired to reach the grand old age of 110, the recommended diet was varied and sensible. They ate three meals a day, a snack in the morning and another toward midday, and then the main meal, which corresponds to our dinner. There was no cutlery. Even the Pharaoh and his family ate using their fingers, though it was considered good manners to use only the three fingers of the right hand. Then as now, bread was produced in a number of different varieties, and it was kneaded by using hands or even feet. Despite the attention paid to their diets, the ancient Egyptians were found to have bad teeth. Archaeological studies of numerous mummies have proved this. But how could they have good diets and bad teeth? 
The answer, surprisingly enough, was due to the bread. Since it was produced with stone ground flour, it contained high quantities of sand, not something you want to crunch on. If you had problems with your teeth, you would have to go to a dentist, a profession that was in great demand at that time. The Egyptians loved their vegetables, garlic, onions, cucumbers, turnips, and lettuce. These were believed to make men amorous and women fertile. They also ate large amounts of seeds from chickpeas, broad beans, and lentils, which were exported all over the Mediterranean. Their favorite fruits were figs, pomegranates, and dates. Roast or grilled beef was considered a delicacy, though the preference was for birds such as geese, ducks, quail, pigeons, and even pelicans, which were also eaten by poorer people. On the other hand, it seems that chickens never appeared on the tables of the pharaohs and their subjects. Wine and strong beer were served at dinner. The wine was kept in sealed pitchers that had labels showing its name, origin, and vintage. These labels are some of the most curious written documents of the ancient world. The invention of writing took place around 3000 BC. As it spread, it allowed for organization of files and record keeping within the country for the first time. Early writing was derived mainly from the observation of nature. Called hieroglyphics, it was a writing system that aimed to represent ideas by means of drawings. The word scribe, for example, was composed of the hieroglyphic zesh. It portrayed a scribe's work utensils, a palette with slots for red and black pigment, a jar or a water sack, a reed pen or a tool for smoothing papyrus, all tied up together. Thanks to this writing system and to the cursive version, Hieratic Script, we can understand the Egyptians' myths, fables, and scientific texts, along with their novels, travel journals, and adventure stories. The first adventure story in history is Egyptian, the story of Sinue, which was written more than 3,000 years ago. Egyptians had a strong sense of family, and women enjoyed a great deal of authority. The most common demonstration of affection was rubbing noses, while kissing was rare. Marriage was very important in ancient Egypt. The pharaoh could have more than one wife, and if he had the chance, lots of concubines. The man's goal was to give at least one child to each woman in his family. This is why Ramses II, one of the greatest Egyptian pharaohs, whose mummy is at the Cairo Museum, fathered more than 140 children. If you were looking for a lover and you couldn't find your way into their heart by regular means, you could resort to magic. Egyptians believed firmly in magic powers. There were magic cures for illnesses, formulas to ward off the evil eye, and love potions. Further down the Nile is Luxor, about 440 miles south of Cairo. Today it is a quiet place with boats skimming over the calm river waters and the narrow streets of the bazaar crossed by horse-drawn cabs popular with tourists. Luxor is the site of the ancient Egyptian city of Thebes, once the most powerful city in the world. Thebes was made capital instead of Memphis after its princes drove off the Hyksos people, who had invaded Egypt around 1500 BC. Thebes, the city of a hundred gates. A city where only the grains of desert sand exceeded the riches that its half a million inhabitants had accumulated. Unlike Memphis, Thebes has not disappeared completely. Amongst the modern buildings, you can still see temples, avenues of sphinxes, and other imposing structures of its magnificent past.
The remains of the temple dedicated to the god Amun bear witness to this. They were restored by archaeological studies at the end of the 19th century with the demolition of hundreds of houses that had been built over them. Some of the excavations are still going on. A 15th century mosque still occupies part of the first courtyard. The temple lies parallel to the Nile. Its dimensions are truly majestic, over 800 feet long and 200 feet wide. On this occasion, the statue of Amun left its more permanent residence in the temple of Karnak and was moved on a sacred boat to visit this temple. It's Ipet Reset, or Southern Harem. Two obelisks stood at the entrance to the temple. Now only one remains, but it is truly grand, over 80 feet high and weighing more than 230 tons. What happened to the second obelisk? Watching over the entrance are colossal statues of Ramses II, the pharaoh who was a fearless warrior. In the northwest corner of the temple's first courtyard is the mosque of Abu el Hagag, held in great esteem by Muslims. Among the columns here are statues of the pharaohs Amenhotep III and Ramses II. Here's what the entrance to the Temple of Amun would have looked like in ancient times. The facade was richly decorated with scenes from the epic battle fought by Ramses II against the Hittites in 1285 BC in Kadesh in modern-day Syria. We can see now how the two massive obelisks would have dominated the entrance. The mystery of what had happened to the second obelisk was solved in 1835 when King Mehmet Ali presented it to King Louis-Philippe of France. Less than two miles separate Luxor from Karnak, the site of the enormous complex dedicated to a trinity of gods, Amun, Montu, and Mut. Ten pylons, enormous surrounding walls, and hundreds of columns are laid out over a surface area that is more than 4,000 feet long and almost 2,000 feet wide, making this the largest temple ever built anywhere in the world. It took 2,000 years to build, and all of the pharaohs contributed something to the final layout. Once you enter the temple, you come to the biggest courtyard of all Egyptian temples, over 300 feet wide and 260 feet long. In the center of the courtyard, only one tall column survives of the 10 that made up the cloister. These were built by Pharaoh Taharqa around 670 BC. This is where the sun boat was kept, which was used for the solemn processions from Karnak to Luxor. Let's see how the site would have looked in all its majesty. The cloister was composed of 10 columns that were each over 60 feet high. Behind the columns, you can see the decorations of the second pylon, which was erected by Ramses II. In the center was a pedestal on which the sacred boat containing the statue of the god Amun was placed. The dimensions of this area are simply colossal. Beyond the second pylon, you enter one of the most imposing monuments we have inherited from Egyptian art. The huge hypostele, which was 330 feet wide and 174 feet deep with 134 columns. Enormous architraves raised the height of the ceiling to 75 feet. The 122 lateral columns with papyrus-shaped capitals are lower. This made it possible to put in windows that create amazing effects of light and shadow. The decorative scenes on the inside walls of the atrium 
carved over 3,000 years ago depict processions and coronation ceremonies. Here we can see Ramses II paying homage to the Theban divinities. The boat is taken in a procession by the priests of Amun, dressed up as mythological beings. The central axis of the temple leads to the most sacred part of the whole complex, the granite room that held the sacred boat. This is one of the two obelisks erected by Queen Hatshepsut. Almost 100 feet high, it is one of the tallest in all of ancient Egypt. Upon her death, her stepson, Pharaoh Tutmos III, who apparently detested her, had a wall built around the obelisk to obliterate the memory of the dead queen. The festival hall built for Tutmos III was later turned into a Christian church, as is seen from the faces of the saints that can still be distinguished on the columns. Of the many rooms in the temple, one of the most interesting is known as the Botanical Garden, because it is decorated with exotic plants and animals, in testimony to the devotion displayed by pharaohs to their gardens and agriculture. And this is the great sacred lake where the priests of Amun-Ra used to purify themselves in the holy water that was channeled here from the Nile. This gigantic granite scarab, or beetle, was considered sacred by the Egyptians. It is said to be of good fortune if you walk around it. Going back north now on the Nile, we come to Cairo, capital of modern Egypt and a metropolis of almost 16 million inhabitants. Cairo was never a capital under the pharaohs. During their reign, there was only a small settlement here called Keriaha, which means place of battle, a name it earned because, according to legend, it was where the gods Horus and Seth fought. The only thing we know about the city's past is that around 500 BC, it was called Babylonia and was an important commercial center. If you visit the Copt Quarter, one of the most ancient and picturesque parts of Cairo, you'll see that it is inhabited today by Orthodox Christians. It contains one of the most important temples in Christianity, the church that played host to the Holy Family and Jesus during their time in Egypt. During the Roman domination, Emperor Trajan had a fortress built here that was flanked by two huge round towers. The remains of the South Tower have been partially restored, while the North Tower was incorporated into the Church of St. George. Further up the Nile, where the river hits the sea, is Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great in 332 BC. It is the last capital of ancient Egypt and where Cleopatra, the last direct descendant of the pharaohs, lived and died. Today, with six million people, Alexandria is the second largest city in Egypt. Though it is an enchanting spot, like most modern cities, the chaotic traffic detracts somewhat from its appeal. In ancient times, it was the site of a great library where thousands of scribes worked documenting the ancient Egyptian lifestyle for posterity. By and large, however, the splendor of the ancient city has been completely buried under the modern neighborhoods. There was a famous lighthouse, the Pharos at Alexandria, built here in 279 BC, that was subsequently damaged by earthquakes. In 1480, Sultan Kuwaitbay used most of its remains to construct this fortress, a masterpiece of military architecture. Some of the lighthouse's granite columns can still be seen in the gate of the main tower, 
and in the surrounding walls that plunge into the sea. Today, it is difficult to imagine the lighthouse in all of its ancient splendor. But when it was built, it was almost 400 feet high and became one of the seven wonders of the world. The lighthouse was one of Cleopatra's favorites. This was her city, a city she loved more than the Roman generals she courted. With her suicide in 30 BC, came the end of 3,000 years of rule by the pharaohs. Egypt lost her independence and became a province of the Roman Empire. As time went by, many of the cities of the pharaohs were abandoned and slowly fell into ruin. The simple houses built with mud bricks disappeared, and many of the monuments became open-air quarries, their stones used to make other buildings. Stones were even removed from the magnificent pyramids. The Madrasa of Sultan Hassan in the city of Cairo was built with stones from the pyramids in 1362. It was a sort of university college, and its design is considered a masterpiece of Islamic architecture. The palace is perfectly proportioned, and its beauty owes a lot to the stones removed from the pyramids and used in its construction. This was a destiny that befell other monuments in the capital over the course of centuries, as magnificent works created by the pharaohs were dismantled. But still today in Egypt, the past and present come together as in no other country in the world. The writers, or scribes, from that time have left us with a treasure trove of literature that documents the amazing episodic adventures of pharaohs and queens, of great loves and tragic battles, and gods for every purpose. Their writings challenge the passing of the centuries and, in a way, proclaim the immortality that was sought by the pharaohs.